þessu vetri og það er að vissa ekki að rökkið eldinni myndu bæta fórskum skilur fritt í orðu sig Þetta er að And good morning, everyone. So today I will be talking on interventions in musculoskeletal radiology. Uh, why I have chosen this topic is because it was part of my big part of my fellowship. And I have divided my talk into three parts. First, giving an introduction of talking about the, about the indications and contraindications of these procedures. And then I, uh, I will just uh, tell about how we do it in our department and in the last part i will show you some cases from my fellowship as well as which we have done here in our department so considering the magnitude of these interventions as we know that radiology in radiology department in every radiology department musculoskeletal imaging diagnostic wise forms a major bulk of the of the procedures, uh, major bulk of the investigations. We have all kinds of X-rays, MRs, ultrasounds, and part of it is also interventions. So why we need why these why we need interventions in musculoskeletal radiology is because we have we have a lot of young population who is athletically active, and these page uh, these patients or athletes they want an immediate pain relief which should be immediate which should be maybe short acting so that they can give good performance over their uh, during the competition and the second important point is uh, in patients with chronic osteoarthritis since we have a, 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 since we have a big pop, uh, big group of aging population so it is not possible to replace every joint in that population so like small joints of the hands and fingers they can provide uh, they can be provided this option of pain relief by uh, injection of steroid and local anesthetic which i will be discussing later in the talk and the third is patients with inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis gout these uh, these patients often have chronic pain symptoms because of sacroiliitis, because of facetal, uh, facetal arthrosis, or because, because of ankylosis. So these, uh, in these patients, these interventions provide a, a boon uh, and relieving their pain. So next point is why we need imaging guiding. Uh, these procedures, most of these procedures can be done uh, as a blind procedure, uh, but the role of inter, uh, the role of imaging comes uh, when the, uh, there are small joints although we can assess every joint with imaging either it's ultra, uh, whether it's ultrasound whether it's mri whether it's ct so uh, what what advantage does imaging provide uh, to us is like it gives us precision and not approximation so we can be very very precise when we are doing the procedure uh, it offers us a real-time imaging when we do it under ultrasound we can see the needle going through the soft tissues hitting the bone or into the appropriate joint and we can even see it on real time when we are injecting the medicine into the joint and that offers us a very very millimetric level of precision in the procedure like around the tendon sheath Normally, we cannot separate the tendon from the tendon sheath, but we can inject the tendon sheath without hitting the tendon with imaging guided. And another important point is this leads to much wider spectrum of these interventions to be practiced. Uh, so we can we can hit almost every deep muscle, almost every tendon, almost close going close to the nerve sheaths. So and another advantage of these procedures are like they are minimally invasive. They are safe, provide immediate pain relief for a longer duration. Various studies have proven this over time that the pain relief with imaging guided interventions is for longer duration and patient feels less post-procedural pain. And important is like there is a documentary proof. Uh, what we usually do is when we go into the joint, we inject the joint with some, uh, with some contrast 
which confirms that we are in the joint. So uh, at a later date, we can always say that the, even if the injection was ineffective in some patients, uh, we can say that we were in the joint. So the spectrum of uh, interventions in musculoskeletal radiology is very wide or broad. Uh, but I will be briefly discussing about the diagnostic and mainly concentrating on the therapeutic interventions. And out of these therapeutic interventions, my main goal will be to stress on steroids and local anesthetic injections, which are used for pain management or form the part of pain clinic. So in the diagnostic group, uh, we do it routinely in our department, uh, like aspiration of fluid for, for analysis, of any kind, biopsies of soft tissues or bone tumors, synovial biopsies, we have not been doing here much, uh, but there is a possibility to do it, to do it under imaging. And then uh, localizing the focus of pain, whether it is joint or tendon, just injecting it with a little bit of local anesthetic if the pain relieves, then that is the, uh, that is the uh, site of origin of pain. And <laughs> another, another important advantage Another important uh, application of interventions is in arthrography, like we can do MR and CT arthrography. In patients which cannot go for MR, we can do CT arthrography, mm -hmm. and the role is in labral tears. Uh, labral tears are not considered to be repaired after the patient is plus 40. So in young patients with recurrent dislocations with hill sacs or uh, uh, with hill sacs lesions or these labral tears are very important and can be repaired if diagnosed properly. And there are various classifications to describe these labral tears. And these can be missed on routine MR. So what we do is we inject the joint with some, some mixture of dye and do the MR with special techniques that provides us a good visualization of the labrum. And about the therapeutic interventions, uh, these could be simple interventions. Steroids and local anesthetic injections come into simple interventions. And there is a modification of this, which is called visco supplementation. That is, uh, instead of steroids, we inject hyaluronic acid, uh, which has been proven to be a little bit more effective than steroids in relieving the pain and maybe in repairing the cartilage to some extent. Uh, but the uh, results are variable. And then there are more complex therapeutic interventions which I have not written here, like we do radiofrequency ablation of the of soft tissue uh, of the bone tumors, like osseoid osteoma, uh, which goes into more, uh, more complex procedures. And coming to the indications of these injections. So indications are many, but the basic indication of uh, putting a patient this from now onwards I will be basically discussing about this steroid and local anesthetic injection for pain relief so the basic indication is in a patient who is refractory to other forms of treatment so what I mean with refractory is patient has been to physiotherapy many times not responding patient has been to rehabilitation programs not getting the adequate results or the patient has been with chronic pain of osteoarthritis or inflammatory arthritis so these are the main uh, ma this is the main indication but if we look medically into various conditions which can lead to this uh, there could be soft tissue conditions and joint conditions so soft tissue conditions could be bursitis again this is important as we cannot see bursa even with ultrasound we see it just as a small bright line but it is possible to inject the bulsa under ultrasound guidance. Tendonitis or inflammation around the tendons, not excluding infection. Infection is a contraindication. We cannot inject <coughs> the patient with steroid if we are suspecting infection. We have to aspirate it. If the fluid is clear, not suspecting infection, we can inject the tendon sheath. But if there is a minimal doubt of infection, we have to rule that first. And then the Important is trigger points, pain trigger points. So anywhere in the body, these trigger points not, uh, not responding to the routine treatment can be injected with small amount of steroid and local anesthetic. Uh, this procedure can be done as single step or two, two step as I told you. 
like a single step procedure will be we just inject it with the local anesthetic if the pain goes that is the cause for patient's pain and then we can inject steroid which gives a long term relief to the patient aspiration of ganglion cysts and then rejecting with steroid and then in various entrapment syndromes uh, this is kind of complex entity entrapment syndromes could be like uh, uh, kind of thoracic outlet syndromes and that goes into complexity because what procedure is available is a botox injection that causes paralysis of the muscles and release of the entrapped nerves and then there could be mortens neuromas fasciitis all these conditions can be injected with steroid and local anesthetic in joint conditions uh, the commonly done procedure aspiration of joint effusion for diagnostic purposes in crystalloid arthropathies like gout synovitis of unknown origin inflammatory arthritis <coughs> and most commonly advanced osteoarthritis so these are some of the indications and obviously if there are indications there must be contraindications so contraindications like uh, they uh, in addition to the usual contraindications uh, we have uh, the important contraindications are like if there is a local cellulitis uh, where we are going to inject uh, if uh, there is local infection there we refrain from injecting that joint or the patient is with septic arthritis or bacteremia uh, always rule out fracture if injecting a patient with effusion and we never inject atlas and patellar tendons with steroids uh, because they are known to cause weakening of the tendons that leads to rupture of the tendons so there are other possibilities in these tendons uh, which i will be explaining to you later on and obviously uh, the universal contraindication if the patient is allergic or has a previous history of anaphylaxis to any of the constituents and relative contraindications are like if the patient is not getting pain relief for two subsequent injections <clears throat> so if the patient says that there has not been any decrease in his or her pain uh, and we have repeated the injection twice and we were in exact within the joint then it shows that the third injection is not going to help the patient uh if there is any underlying coagulopathy these are the usual things uncontrolled diabetes is important because after steroids the sugar levels of these patients often rise and they can go up to 25% they can go up by 25% so we usually instruct the patients if they are diabetic to monitor their sugar for at least 3 4 days it's expected to go up uh so coming to the second part of my talk how we do it we are still in the process of uh, making a particular standardized operating protocol uh, but uh, from january after the completion of my fellowship we have done few cases and this is what we have uh, we have made out of it so the first step will be a physician's requisition so uh, physician's requ uh, requisition should contain three or four important uh, mentions before ordering an injection uh, so this is this is for the information of everybody for the gps as well uh, do mention patient's diagnosis whether the working diagnosis is osteoarthritis or inflammatory arthritis what you are suspecting clinically that always helps us and please mention about the about the joint to be injected and be specific about the site to be injected uh, there has been incidences where the patient uh, where the requisition says that the right shoulder joint and patient says my left shoulder joint is bad part of it could be that there has been two to three months of waiting or something like that patient had right shoulder pain and then patient got left shoulder pain and got okay on the right side so uh, do mention about the side and the joint to be injected and in case of facets uh, to be more specific uh, do mention about which facet joint like right side c4 c5 facet or bilateral l34 lumbar facets or l45 lumbar facets since i don't do the clinical examination there i i know basically i, I usually ask the patient like where is the pain uh, just double confirm it uh but there are various options in this phase at injection there can be nerve blocks there could be just phase at injection there could be epidural injections so 
it's always best that the clinician mentions this so that I will be double confident about which facets or which joints I am injecting or are these the right joints or not. And if the patient is on any other kind of steroids, this is also important. Sometimes the patient with rheumatoid arthritis or any other inflammatory arthritis are on other kind of oral steroids or other steroid preparations. And since we cannot give a particular, more than particular amount of steroids to a patient in a particular year, it is important to know if the patient is taking any other kind of steroids. And the general information about the patient like known allergy, infection or bleeding disorders. So uh, for, for this requisition, we don't have a particular form to fill in. Uh, what we are doing is we are right now we are receiving the requisitions as we do for CT or MRI. Like you order a CT abdomen and just mention a brief history. So concentrating on these three or four points, uh, you can send us a requisition. And then the second step is after we receive the requisition, uh, the findings of previous imaging of that patient is reviewed. So uh, we usually go to the patient's folder and see what MR has been done. If it has, he has been asked for facet cell 3L4, usually confirm that there is facetal arthropathy and the patient is with pain. So that one plus one makes 11. So then we decide after we are satisfied with okay this patient needs injection uh, we try to fit that patient into a particular modality which modality will be best for patient's intervention so these modalities would be most commonly used is fluoroscopy for big and small joints and ultrasounds i usually use for soft tissues and tendons and bursa injections and for aspiration of calcific tendinosis MRI, we do. The uh, there are needles which are compatible with MRI, but we don't have this facility in our department. And uh, the complex procedures could be CT guided. So uh, then we decide about which modality, and uh, we book the patient. And important thing is, irrespective of modality, the procedure and medications remain the same. It doesn't change if we are doing CT or ultrasound guided. The dose of the drugs remain the same. And then the patient is given appointment to come on this and this date. We don't need the patient to be fasting. We don't need the patient. Uh, we, we don't need some complex blood workup before the patient comes, except for complex procedures like soft tissue or bone biopsies. And another important thing is the patient should be accompanied by someone who can drive him or her back home. This is because usually the patient, uh, the bulk of the patients uh, come for upper or lower limb injections. And when the local anesthetic or the steroid, it goes along the path of the nerve, it can produce numbness in hand or limb. Maybe for, maybe ranging from, from after immediately after the injection to six hours or seven hours, depending on the potency of the local anesthetic. So this is very important. If the patient is driving back and feels numbness, he will not feel the clutch and other things. So, this is a bit of risky thing. So we always explain the patient to come with them, uh, with an attendant. And on the procedure day, patient arrives in the department. Uh, we follow the usual norm, uh, take informed consent, explaining the risks and complications and uh, uh, the main risks and complications of the procedure. And here important is we ask the patient about how is his or her pain before doing the procedure. So uh, this is done according to VAS scale. VAS means like visual analog scale. Like we just ask the patient to grade his pain level before we inject, like from zero to 10. Patient says like five or six, just an arbitrary number from zero to 10. And that is recorded in our pain chart. I will be showing you the examples of pain charts which we have in our department. And these are important to know whether the patient is improving. Uh, because if we don't give pain chart to the patient, he might come back again. Because some people, they get so used to visiting the radiology department, like I have seen in Canada, they are automatically booking themselves, going to their GPs, okay, book me, and they are not getting any kind of relief. So when we see the patient's pain chart, we, we always, uh, we, we have an idea like if the pain is improving or not. And uh, 
as I discussed, no blood tests are needed except for complex procedures like biopsy. And how the procedure is done after taking informed consent and the procedural pain level, uh, usually the patient is positioned, uh, mainly supine or maybe sitting. And the potential site where I need to go or where we need to go is marked on uh, with imaging guidance. And then uh, we infiltrate the skin with <coughs> local anesthetic. Uh, we use around 1% of lidocaine for cutaneous uh, local anesthesia for skin. And then the needle is advanced into the joint under imaging guidance. And when we are uh, when we are confident that we are in the joint, uh, check contrast injection is done, and which shows free flow of contrast into the joint. Uh, that confirms the needle position. And after this, uh, the medication, which consists of a mixture of steroid and local anesthetic, mixed in the same syringe, we inject into the joint, and then we give post-procedure instructions to the patient, which I will discuss later on. So briefly about the various agents we can use for these injections. Uh, I will not go into the detail of this slide, uh, but mainly use our methylprednisolone and trimacinolone. And both of these have intermediate potency and duration. And their doses, they vary from which joint we need to inject. So they are less for small joints, more for large joints, and also depends on how frequently we are injecting these joints. So the important thing is this short acting, they have less, they have less post-injection flare, steroid flare, and the long acting suspensions have prolonged effect. Important is like the name says methyl acetate, trimacinolone acetonide. So trimacinolone and methyl prednisolone, they are the steroids in this. And we have suspension, like uh, to suspend those in particle form, we have acetate and acetonide. So the patients are usually more allergic to these components rather than steroid per se. So these are the main culprits in allergic reactions to patients. So we try to, to do this in another form if the patient is allergic to a particular form. <coughs> Okay, so, and briefly about these steroids, and then I, uh, I mix these steroids, uh, then we mix this steroid with ropivacaine. Uh, it's a kind of local anesthetic, and 1% ropivacaine, that is 10 milligram per ml of ropivacaine. Why this is mixed with steroids? Uh, because steroids comes in form of suspension in particle form. Uh, we have to uh, mix it so that we have the volume in our syringe so that the, uh, the steroid is better diffused within the joint and patient gets good pain relief. And also this local anesthetic acts immediately. It provides immediate pain relief. And if the patient gets pain relief, uh, that usually helps in confirming the diagnosis that this is the site of patient's pain. And if the steroid starts acting, patient will get a good pain-free interval for three to six months or maybe around can be one year in some patients. And alternatively, we can also use uh, 0.25 to 5% bupivacaine in, instead of ropivacaine. So there are various drugs uh, to be used, but I usually prefer trimacinolone with a uh, varying quantity of ropivacaine. Uh, as with all other procedures, uh, there are risks associated with these injections. Uh, the risks are common to as common to all procedures. Infection could be local infection, could be septic arthritis, bleeding, or patient can get bruise, and allergic reactions, and then temporary weakness. These I have already discussed. And important is post injection steroid flare. So uh, this is something which develops after 24 to 36 hours after injection. It is nothing but pro, uh, produces local symptoms like patient can have a sense of warmth or heaviness in the injected joint or it, uh, it could be red for some time. But it's a self-limiting condition and can be dealt with ice packs. So like if, if I have injected uh, or if we have injected in the radiology department some patient with, uh, with a steroid and Patient goes to GP in the evening or, or comes to sleep and uh, with a swollen joint, it is not always infection. It can be a steroid flare. So just ice packs will help. 
And uh, another important is if we are in, uh, injecting the superficial areas like in lateral epicondylitis, uh, it could uh, it is quite close to the skin and subcutaneous. So some steroid might go under the skin or subcutaneous areas, leading to focal atrophy of the skin or hypopigmentation. Uh, this uh, sometimes can be seen. It's not a, a rare a rare complication. And then uh, very rarely seen is tendon rupture. Uh, tendon rupture is uh, this condition arises only when we our needle tip goes into the tendon and we inject into the tendon. First of all, it is very difficult to inject into the tendon. It offers a lot of resistance when we are in the tendon. And second, since we are doing it under imaging guidance, the chances are extremely low to inject into the tendon. And as I have already described, for all diabetic patients, uh, we tell them that their blood sugar is going to increase in subsequent days. And uh, after the procedure is done, uh, post-procedure, we always give a set of instructions to the patient to be followed. First is a uh, patient doesn't leave the department for 15 to 30 minutes. This is an observation period to rule out immediate allergic reactions or the, if the patient is feeling dizzy because of vasovagal symptoms. And the effect could be after injection, patient may feel better due to local anesthetic. Uh, the dictum is that steroid doesn't start acting immediately. So local anesthetic take care of first day of pain. And then in a day or two, steroid effect <clears throat> comes into play. And then sometimes some patients may feel soreness within the joint for some, uh, for few few hours. Uh, we usually, if the patient is sore immediately after injection, uh, which is again not very commonly seen, we tell the patient to apply just ice ice packs, but no longer than 15 minutes at a time, once or twice per hour, and use the 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 normal NSAIDs. Another instruction is we tell, always tell the patient to take it easy for a few days. Patient can do their routine work, daily work, but if their work involves like lifting heavy weight or with heavy machinery, we tell the patient to refrain it for a day or two. And then also patient need to observe for flu-like symptoms to rule out any infection in subsequent days. And the important thing is we, ex uh, we hand over the patient a pain chart. And this pain chart helps us in further in better managing the patient for future injections. And he always has to carry this pain chart and bring it to his general physician or specialist or to our department when patient comes next time. So this is an example of pain chart which we have uh, developed here. So this is for the joint injection just explaining briefly about the procedure and what the patient needs to do in subsequent days. And uh, this is a tabulated form uh, where we, we record the, pay, uh, where, uh, which is given to the patient and patient, we record the pre-procedure. Uh, here we record the pre-procedure pre pain level, like the pay, patient says the pain level is seven. This is a visual, analog scale so and then we record the pain level immediately after the procedure and subsequently the patient fills this chart for the next five days and can continue this further on so we know if how much drop in pain level is there when patient next time visits us this is for the joints and there is another form of chart for the for the spine for the cervical and lumbar spine so first page is similar to as the joint injection. The second page is little different. We ask the patient to maintain this chart for six weeks instead of one week in the joint. So patient, we record the patient's level when he was, he was worst, with worst level of pain and then with average level of pain when he was better during the last 15 minutes after injection, how, how is the pain level? And then he has to maintain this for first week, second week and goes on till six weeks. So we know how effective are the injections. So this is a kind of uh, tabulated form of how we grade the response. So there usually if there is less than 
improvement in pain score or worsening of pain, then it is a poor response. And subsequently, we graded moderate, good, and excellent response, adding on two or three points of pain relief. So the uh, important thing is about pain relief after the procedure. Patients usually ask like, how long will I get the pain relief? How frequently I have to come to the department? And uh, what, are, what, uh, what are my functional, uh, function, uh, like how can I function after these injections? So the results are variable. Various studies have proved that there are no, there are no definite assurance values we can give to the patient. Uh, usually they provide a short to midterm pain relief that is between three weeks to three months but uh, from my ex uh, my experience I have seen patients which have which which say that I was injected last year and I was fine for whole year uh, it could be one year or it could be just few days patient comes after one week no I, I was not good but the only thing is if the patient comes after one week we cannot inject the patient again we have to provide at least four to six weeks of interval between two injections. So that is important. Steroids we are giving, we cannot give one repeatedly over a short interval. So we have to provide four to six weeks of gap between two injections. And the in, sorry. I'm just judging. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then the important thing is we cannot inject more than four injections per year it is not recommended and if the patient is not improving after two injections we should probably should not inject the patient third time uh, what what we were following in canada is like three injections if the patient didn't improve in three injections we usually refuse the patient for the treatment and tell his or her clinician to see for alternative treatment methods and also important thing is injecting more steroids will lead to hypothalamic which we are renal suppression so we also have to take this into account and coming to the third part these are a set of few cases which i will be showing to you uh, these some of these cases are from my fellowship and some of these i have done over the last four months here in our department uh, so these cases uh, divided into upper limb and lower limb interventions uh, this first slide shows the ultrasound image the transverse ultrasound image of the acromioclavicular joint uh, we see good amount of capsular hypertrophy and irregularity patient had focal pain and tenderness at this site uh, and you can see uh, under ultrasound guidance uh, you can see the needle tip within the capsule and subsequently there are Echoes secondary to steroid injection. So you can be quite uh, quite accurate in injecting these joints. And the procedure is just 10 minutes procedure. And after that, patient is uh, made to sit in the department for 15 to 20 minutes for immediate complications. And another example injection uh, of the glenohumeral joint, that is the shoulder joint. Uh, this is a fluoroscopic picture. So procedures are mainly done under fluoroscopy and under ultrasound, uh, depending on the previous imaging and which procedure is suitable for the patient. So this shows the contrast tracking into the glenohumeral joint. That means we are in the joint and subsequently the steroid and local anesthetic was injected. And there is a modification to this procedure called arthrodistension. This arthrodistension uh, is a special kind of procedure done in patients with adhesive capsulitis. Adhesive capsulitis is basically a clinical diagnosis, but we have some MR features. So it is always important before this procedure and diagnosis, we have a, a pre-procedure MR of this patient. And second important thing is if the patient comes for arthrodistension, we always ask the uh, we always ask if the patient has an appointment for physiotherapy immediately after this procedure uh, what we aim in uh, in this is uh, inject the steroid like same manner we inject any other joint and after this uh, we in distend the joint with the normal saline so amount of saline to be injected depends from patient to patient the purpose is uh, pay 
purpose is to rupture the capsule of the shoulder joints to break the adhesions. And after this, the patient immediately goes to, to physiotherapy and that further helps in regaining the movement as the main problem in adhesive capsulitis is a restricted range of motion. And another example, uh, injection of long head of biceps, uh, ultrasound image showing fluid around the biceps tendon. Uh, suggesting tenosynovitis and you can see the needle tip and distension of this tendon sheath. So we just go into this potential space of few millimeter, few millimeters. So it is possible to inject and this procedure we have been doing quite often. I have not done this uh, here so far, but <coughs> in Canada, I, like people are referring to this like three or four injections a day. And this is a patient uh, from here, patient with calcific tendinosis and supraspinatus, had a restricted range of motion and pain. And the calcific tendinosis was confirmed on sonography. This is a sonographic image showing a big calcification in supraspinatus tendon measuring around two centimeters. The procedure offered to this patient was barbotage. So this is a kind of a fancy name for a simple procedure. So what we do is just take a thick needle and go into the calcification and puncture it at multiple places. Uh, so th that is the procedure. And after the puncturing, the, uh, the basic mechanism of uh, this is like we puncture the calcification that dissipates into subacromian bursa, uh, which triggers healing, which triggers the body into healing. So that is, that is the basic uh, uh, basic fundamental behind this intervention. Uh, some people do inject local anesthetic, distend the capsule, and try to try to uh, take out some calcifications, liquid calcifications from this. Uh, effectiveness is varied. So, uh, and you can see the thickened bursa. The bursa is usually in, uh, inflamed after doing this dry needling many uh, for some time. Uh, the steroid, uh, some people inject mixture of steroid and local anesthetic into the bursa, but I usually prefer to inject just the local anesthetic into the bursa so that patient gets immediate pain relief uh, because steroid will suppress the inflammation. The basic fundamental why the, this calcification is triggered into reabsorption is to produce inflammation, not to suppress it. And I have a few post-procedural images and these like sort of worm-like things you can see, these are the calcifications. I usually don't aspirate these calcifications than just to show the patient. And uh, this is a post-procedure x-ray after, after around one and a half to two months. This shows complete reabsorption of calcification and there is a streak of calcification still in the bursa. So from here, like, we always have two decisions. Patient may have ongoing pain, which is, uh, which is seen in reabsorptive phase of this calcification. And or the patient is having some pain, which is tolerable. So we can even re-inject this patient with some local anesthetic or steroid at this time. But ultimately, the body will automatically trigger reabsorption of whole of the calcium and patient is going to recover from pain by natural mechanisms. I didn't put that effect. <laughs> so uh, examples of other joint injections like uh, STT joint in injection in the wrist, elbow arthrogram to diagnose any problems in the cartilage. And this was also commonly done. Uh, I did a lot of these procedures in Canada, at least three or four patients a day. First, carpometacarpal osteoarthritis. So it's, it's, a, it's a small but difficult joint to go into. Uh, so this shows the contrast into the first carpometacarpal and after this we usually give steroid. Steroid dose is usually less uh, as compared to the large joints. And this is the radiocarpal joint. Uh, these are all fluoroscopic images. So, so basically we can target every joint of the wrist the hand or the fingers 
uh, with fluoroscopy, even of the of the shoulder and the elbow. And uh, this is another example under ultrasound guidance. You can see the dislocated extensor carpi ulnaris tendon from the ulnar groove. Uh, this patient has a typical focal pain spot or a trigger point. Uh, subsequently was injected with steroid. You can see the distended tendon sheath after steroid <coughs> injection. So uh, important thing is uh, there is a risk of injecting into the tendon. So when you are doing it under ultrasound, you can see the distended tendon sheet and not the contra, not the steroid going into the tendon. So that prevents tendon up there. Again, uh, little complex procedure, suprascapular now block, CT guided intervention can be done under ultrasound guidance with the patient sitting and coming from behind. Uh, in this procedure, patient is lying prone. You can see the suprascapular notch and neurovascular bundle here and showing the needle tip close to that notch and that leads to uh, pain relief to the patient. And uh, some of the diagnostic applications of, uh, of musculoskeletal interventions. Uh, so this, is, this patient was with known breast cancer, came with a lytic uh, destructive lesion in the acromion and this is the case done here. Uh, lytic destructive lesion and the main challenge was to go into the acromion uh, and preventing the pathological fracture. So we could manage to go hit that lesion in the center and take out some uh, good samples and histopathology proved this to be a metastatic deposit and there was no pathological fracture. Another, another uh, diagnostic indication is shoulder arthrograms or the hip arthrograms. Uh, we inject the joint with just a mixture of contrast and then we take the images under MRI. So this is a mixed procedure. Patient is given appointment in fluoroscopy for contrast injection and then we do MR. So with MR, we, this is basically done to look for the labral Pathologies. Here we can see the contrast tracking through this sublabral foramen, which is a normal variant, which can be misdiagnosed as tear on routine MR. And the wrist arthrogram we did recently last week. This procedure the patient was uh, queried for STT ligament injury, and the purpose was to inject into the mid carpal space and see the tracking of contrast along the flexor carpi radialis tendon, which is the typical. Uh, typical abnormality seen in these kind of patients. So post-injection MR arthrogram shows the contrast is limited just to the mid-carpal space, not going into the into the radiocarpal space or not tracking along the flexor carpal radialis, which I have not shown here. And coming to the second part of illustrations, the lower limb, the right hip injection commonly done, contrast within the hip joint capsule outlining the capsule post injection you can see the dissipation of contrast this is dilution of contrast secondary to steroid and local anesthetic and uh, another patient ct guided intervention left with left piriformis syndrome needle tip in position within the piriformis and post injection we can see some air bubbles and some hypodensity suggesting contrast deposition at the adequate site and for reference, I have attached the pain chart in this patient. And uh, we have done uh, two types of intervention with this patient. To start with, this patient had uh, eight level pain. So we, we didn't have the pain charts at that time developed later on. So this patient started with level eight pain pre-procedure. After first injection, dropped to level four. And this was after second injection from four, dropped to level two. So the response is good from eight to two, patient is basically having some discomfort, not rather pain. Most of it is marked as two. And then there are procedures like Achilles tendon injections. Uh, this is kind of uh, uh, like we have various possibilities to do the Achilles tendon. Steroids we don't inject. The only thing is uh, see the sonographic findings. There is bulky achilles with hypervascularity. Hypervascularity relates to chronic pain in the patient. So important is to get rid of these vessels, which can be done just with dry needling. You can see the needle tip going into the achilles tendon where there was, there was evident hypervascularity and destroying these vessels. And that uh, leads to blood accumulation, which triggers the body into healing. 
Uh, otherwise, uh, there are various modifications of this procedure. We can inject even dextrose solution into the atlas tendon. We can even do uh, stripping, uh, stripping the tendon's uh, lower surface and the superficial surface by injecting local anesthetic. We can even use PRP, that is platelet-rich plasma, a costly investigation. Uh, we get the platelets from the laboratory and inject it. Can be done with autologous blood. Just take out some blood from patient's vein. Two, three ml and inject into the atlas tendon so all these procedures but effectiveness still varies from patient to patient it is usually uh, usually the effectiveness is around to 50 to 60 percent 50 percent get some kind of pain relief uh, but it may not be effective in rest of the 50 percent of patients foot injections another example like small joints in the hand we can inject small joints in the foot uh, example of third fourth fifth tarsometatarsal joint injection contrast going into the joints and then this is after injection, you can see the distended joint after the steroid injection. Another example, subtalar joint injection. And coming to the last part, the cervical spine inject, uh, the spine injections could be in the cervical spine, lumbar spine or sacroiliac joints. So cervical spine injection, this we, uh, we just do on the fluoroscopy and use dexamethasone. And lumbar spine uh, facet injection is done with trimalsinone and local anesthetic. So just aim for these facets and uh, inject the medicine. There is a risk of a potential risk of vertebral artery dissection in cervical facet injection. So you have to be really careful. And then sacroiliac joint injections. The needle tip in position contrast shows normal uh, contrast flowing through the sacroiliac joint. And then these are the list of MSK injections. Uh, which uh, we are capable of doing here uh, in our department. Uh, I have mentioned almost all, but important is like we, uh, we can also inject carpal tunnel syndrome patients, lumbar and sacral nerve root blocks, and visco supplementation that is hyaluronic acid directly injected into the knee joint, and then scapulothoracic bursal injections patients with repetitive scapulothoracic pain can be injected with this. And so this completes my presentation. The basic uh, reason behind presenting this is to just to give an overview and how our department is planning to go about these, these injections. And if you have any kind of queries or anything, you are free to, to call me anytime. Uh, but this is basically how we go about it. <laughs> I promise I didn't, I didn't, we didn't prepare. <laughs> okay, so we start, um, how, once the patient is injected, I see that there's a complete chart. How is the follow-up? Do they do for you? How? Uh, they, are, they are supposed to carry that pain chart. We usually instruct the patient to maintain that pain chart and go to their GPs or the referring physicians or the specialists and show them the pain chart. So physician can always see like if there is improvement in the scale of the pain or not. And he can order a re-injection if needed with that patient. And then again, the same steps, the requisition comes to us. The patient has to bring that pain chart along with. We always instruct them to carry that pain chart always. And then we also see that pain chart for our reference if the patient is improving or not. So. I was just wondering, uh, since uh, this is the important information, that uh, we could maybe think about uh, having this paint chart done electronically, which it could be uh, imported directly <coughs> into the journal. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you, Ujjal. It's uh, important to know what you can do, and that's quite a lot. Uh, this seems to be something that the general physician should know. Have you meant to talk to them about this? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I have talked to them, but uh, I haven't arranged a uh, like particular meeting with the general physicians. I always try to call them and tell them that these are the facilities available. And even I have talked to the doctors in Leknastova, the, the orthopedician, orthopedics team in, in our hospital, and then in Leknastova. So, 
Yeah, yeah, that was the purpose because uh, from January we were preparing that we didn't have the adequate drugs or the proper concentration of drugs available here. So now they are available. Uh, and also we have to work it from the scratch, make the pain charts. I had those in English, got it translated uh, with the help of our technical staff. And uh, so now we have at least a, a framework how to do it. We are going to improve uh, subsequently on seeing what problems we are facing. So. No, no.